friends in my last lecture i gave a conclusion of module 4 until module 4 we did not take up any specific method to consider its extraction process we are going to start that starting with this module module 5 this module is about production of metals from oxide sources. Now, there are many, many metals which occur in nature in oxide form, one oxide or another. We are all familiar with iron ore, iron ore or iron oxide, but this course is not about iron, but there are other metals, many of them which are mostly found in some form of an oxide or could be a carbon which can be converted into an oxide quite easily. I will start with a magnesium. Why magnesium? The reason why I will start with magnesium is because it is a very straightforward pyrometallurgical process, easy to understand and the principles are also easy to follow. There could be other reasons to justify why I start with magnesium, but I need not go into that. Before I come to discuss uh, production of magnesium from a source, let me first tell you what are the learning objectives about in this module. The learning objectives are listed here. First, I will discuss some basic approaches in oxide reduction, which may or may not be of general nature, which may or may not apply everywhere. But for a large number of oxides, the basic approaches will be applicable, you will find that. Then I will discuss special features or specific extraction processes. As I indicated last time, there may be two metals occurring in nature in oxide form, maybe in similar form, but the way we extract them may not be exactly alike. And there are many reasons for that, we will discuss that. Thirdly, we are going to discuss them individually. As I said, start with the magnesium, then, then I will spend a good amount of time on aluminum. I will also discuss production of tin and production of ferroalloys, as well as one or two others. I will make a passing reference. Earlier in my lectures, I had discussed why we will discuss ferroalloys also, although this course is for non-ferrous metals. Ferroalloys mean alloys of non-ferrous metals with iron. So, it falls both in the category of ferrous metallurgy as well as non-ferrous metallurgy. But there is justification of discussing ferroalloys in this course on non-ferrous metals, because there are some metals, non-ferrous metals, which are largely produced as ferroalloys. And the reason for that is that these metals, which are produced as ferroalloys, are often important alloying additions in steel. And they will be added as a ferroalloy because when you have the metal and iron together in an alloy form, that alloy dissolves much faster in steel. Also, that melting point is low, plus it is easier to produce that ferroalloy rather than that alloying element, the non-ferrous alloying element in elemental form. So, uh, it is very, very justifiable that I discuss ferroalloys which contain iron 
as well as large percentages of non ferrous metals. Lastly, I would also discuss as I go along the importance of energy and environment related issues, because many of them would be high temperature processes and energy and environment related issues automatically become very important. It should be quite obvious to you that there should be no dearth of oxides in the crust of our planet, because if you remember the table that I have shown in the very beginning regarding relative abundance of elements, we had seen that oxygen, silicon and aluminum are at the very top. They account for most of the elements in earth's crust and then we will, we will have iron. So, if oxygen, silicon and aluminum are abundant, then it is quite natural that in earth's crust there is an abundance of silicates, aluminates and aluminosilicates. That is why you find sand everywhere. One also finds abundant reserves of alumina L 2 O 3. There are also aluminosilicates like the clay, it is an aluminosilicate. Now, obviously, all that you find in earth's crust they do have oxides, silicates or aluminosilicates, but if we are looking for a specific oxide, then you have to go through some concentration steps. You have to concentrate that particular oxide which we are aiming at and from which we will extract a metal or more than a metal. Now, there are many methods of upgradation magnetic separation, electrostatic separation, gravity separation and in rare cases flotation is also applicable. Now, this flotation that I have listed may be a different kind of flotation, by different kind I mean generally in sulphide metallurgy when you float the sulphide minerals float to the top and the gang material goes down. When we have a mass of oxides which are very rich and the gang content is low, we might try a flotation process where it is the gang which floats up and the oxides we want they do not float. It could be that kind of flotation. We will come to that as and when it becomes relevant. Now, you also know by now that oxides of aluminum and calcium are very, very stable. Therefore, many oxides that we separate out can be in theory reduced by aluminum or calcium at a suitably high temperature. If you remember the Ellingham diagram, the free energy temperature plots, free energies of formation and temperature plots for aluminum and calcium were far below than the free energy formation plots for many other oxides. So, in theory we should be able to reduce many other oxides by using aluminum or calcium. This is in theory, but it does not apply in all cases. For example, in theory we may be able to reduce oxides of sodium or cal sodium or potassium, but then the temperatures required may be so high that the elements will volatilize, you will not be able to collect. So, there are practical problems. So, the theory may say something, but it may not be possible. There is another problem which I had also mentioned. Oxides of titanium, uranium, aluminum, etcetera, in theory should be reduced by carbon, 
because we have seen that carbon monoxide becomes increasingly stable with increasing temperature and all oxides becomes increasingly unstable at higher temperature. So, the two plots cross the free energy of formation versus temperature for carbon is formation carbon monoxide goes downwards and for free energies of formation of oxide go upwards, there is always a crossover point. For stable oxide is very high, for lower oxide it for unstable oxide it is a lower temperature. So, in theory even oxides of titanium, uranium, aluminum can be reduced by carbon, but unfortunately there is another reaction which is also thermodynamically feasible and that is formation of carbide. So, if you produce reduce try to reduce oxides of titanium, uranium, aluminum etcetera by carbon, we will not be able to produce the metals, we will end up producing a carbide. So, the theory that that hints at something does not work. All oxide reductions are endothermic, they need high temperature. So, the oxide reduction in general would need a lot of heat. Firstly, high temperature require heat and secondly, they are endothermic, so that will also need heat. Moreover, if you are using carbon as a reducing agent, you produce CO and CO2, both are undesirable both have give you pollution problem starting with local problems, regional problems, global problems, global climate change everything. So, there are practical problems with high temperature reduction processes. We will see what we can do, what we cannot do. Let us start with magnesium. Now, I might start with the uses of magnesium. You do not see magnesium being used in our everyday life, not like aluminum. You have aluminum vessels, containers, you have aluminum doors and windows, but in many alloys there is magnesium. You also see magnesium in many places unseen like Magne without magnesium you cannot have firecrackers. Now, I am listing here some uses of magnesium. The non-structural uses will include alloying in magnesium and in many other places. Since magnesium oxide produces a stable, magnesium produces a stable oxide, it is used in deoxidation you want to remove oxygen from some place add magnesium, you want to remove sulfur from some you know, metals add magnesium, because magnesium sulfide is also very stable. So, in montreal metals we will add magnesium for deoxidation and desulfurization. In steel magnesium is added for modification of structures of graphite in cast iron you read about nodular cast iron that in cast iron if you add magnesium then the cast iron flakes become nodular rounded. So, the entire property of cast iron changes. I also mentioned the cast iron is used in pyrotechnics that is in firecrackers. It used to be very commonly used in photography because when it burns it emits a lot of light. So, 40, 50 years ago we used to have this flash bulbs which will which will just burn once a lot of light the magnesium filament. Another very interesting use of magnesium is in cathodic protection of under steel structure. We must understand this. Suppose there is a port and there are a lot of structure where the pillars are going into the water. Also those that are above the water they are also exposed to saline environment both go under both undergo corrosion. Now, magnesium is used in cathodic protection means 
chunks, tablets, rods of magnesium are connected to the structure and allowed to remain immersed in that environment in water or in the environment. The idea is that magnesium is more electro positive, more reactive than iron. So, if there is corrosion going to take place, it will be the magnesium which will get corroded. So, magnesium gets corroded protecting the steel structure which is less reactive than magnesium. Actually, some of our colleagues and I had gone to Paradeep port once, suggesting to the port authorities that they adopt this, because we saw in the structures that they were standing on pillars, many of them had been eaten away. Means, a structure going like this, just near the water, there is a big dent, means that is where corrosion is taken. Actually, maximum corrosion takes place when there is a three phase boundary, that is air, there is metal, and there is water level. That is where maximum it takes place. We said that if you just hang some magnesium from the structure, you protect the structure. Now, some of them thought, they have actually asked me, will it grow back again? Now, that is not possible. Magnesium is not going to make the structure go back to the original dimension but it would not allow further corrosion of that. So, that is called cathodic protection that you use a magnesium cathode to protect the rest of the structure. Now, there are other uses in alloying, in aluminum base alloys it imparts hardness, strength and corrosion resistance. In lead base alloys containing calcium, tin, etcetera, it improves mechanical properties. I have mentioned that it is used in desulfurization and deoxidation. Here is an example in pig iron, less than 0 0.01 percent magnesium is injected in mag coke or magnesium wire. The, the way you add is very interesting. It comes in a wire form, it continuously rotated and where goes into the melt and goes on dissolving. Or there can be a uh, something called mag coke, that coke mixed with magnesium that can be put in there also. The reason why you have to be careful, otherwise magnesium will float, it is a very light metal. You cannot take magnesium and add in steel, nothing will happen, it will float up and it will burn up. So, you will have to push in an wire or push in in the form of mag coke which will go to the bottom. As again I mentioned earlier that it is added to cast iron to nodulize graphite particles to produce spheroidal graphite, which is called SG iron, which is stronger, tougher and more ductile. Where does magnesium come from? <coughs> magnesium comes from two main sources, dolomite, which is written as magnesium carbonate calcium carbonate together or we can write it as M G C A C A C O 3 twice. The mineral composition is M G C A C O 3 twice or magnesite which is only magnesium carbonate. This is far more common. There is magnesium in sea water also in the dissolved state as magnesium chloride or magnesium sulphate. There are some exposed seabeds where the water has dried off and there is extensive deposits of carnalite, which is written as MgCl2 KCl seals H2O. It is called carnalite, a mineral of this composition. There are other sources like olivine, which is a silicate serpentine, which is also a silicate, asbestos. The common asbestos you saw that is used for roofing is also a mineral calcium carbonate 3 Mg SiO 2. So, it is a combination of calcium and magnesium. Another is called kyanite MgSO4 KCl 2 H 2 O. 
need not remember all this. We should know that only the first three are important dolomite, magnesite, and the whatever is available in the sea, either in exposed bed or in sea water. For that, there will be a different process. Let us try to understand how we get magnesium from dolomite or magnesite. The logic should be simple that if you have a carbonate, you can heat it, produce MgO and reduce by carbon, Mg plus CO. Or if you have dolomite, which is magnesium carbonate dot calcium carbonate or Mg Ca CO3 twice, that can also be reduced by carbon or you can take magnesium oxide, which can be reduced by calcium carbide to produce calcium oxide, magnesium and carbon or magnesium oxide can be, there should be an O here, I am sorry, write it 3 MgO, 3 MgO, which can be reduced by aluminum, produce alumina and magnesium vapor. Unfortunately, none of them look commercially attractive for various reasons. I would rather not go into that. Either the temperature requirement is very high, or recovery is not good, product does not come the way you want it, etcetera, etcetera. The most commercially in attractive process is reduction of MgOCAO that we get from dolomite by ferrosilicon, where the silicon actually is the reducing agent. You can write the reaction as this magnesium vapor, a slag 2 CO SiO 2 plus iron solid. We will do a thermodynamic analysis of this to show that you simply cannot heat decomposed dolomite MgOCO with ferrosilicon and get magnesium vapor, you cannot. Because normally this reaction is not feasible. You have to drive it to the right and to drive, we will have to manipulate the vapor pressure of magnesium. You have to bring it down, so that the reaction moves rightward. So, reduction is driven to the right by vacuum condensation of magnesium vapors and that will eliminate back reaction also. Now, before I proceed with this, let me ask a simple question. We are talking about two main things. One is dolomite, which is MgCO3, CaCO3, or you can write it as MgCaCO3 twice. Or we are talking about magnesite. Mg CO3. How do you know at what temperature it will decompose? There is a very simple way of finding that in the laboratory, and that is by thermogravimetry. By thermogravimetry, we mean that inside a furnace. We keep a small amount of the sample, magnesium carbonate or dolomite. The sample size can be very small, maybe say 0.5 gram or even less. This is connected to a balance. Now, this furnace is heated and we put it the time temperature plot like this with temperature rises with time. 
and we keep measuring its weight. We will find that initially there will be the weight, there will be no weight loss, but as the decomposition starts, this will start losing weight and the balance can measure it. There is a device for equilibrium equilibration. So, we can put it like this, this is temperature versus time plot. Let us plot weight loss means W delta W between this and this. Initially, it is balancing then start waiting load. If we plot the weight loss, we will find that initially there is no weight loss, but after some time it begins to lose weight. This temperature where it is beginning to accelerate the weight loss, we will call it the decomposition temperature. Now, please mind you, what is the meaning of the word decomposition temperature? Talk about the boiling point of water. You know, if you take water, leave it here in a dry weather, it forms vapor, does mean it is boiling. If you increase the temperature, more vapor will come out. We say that under one atmosphere pressure, the boiling point is 100 degrees. It means at 100 degrees, the decomposition gives rise to partial pressure of vapor equal to one atmosphere. So, 100 degrees boiling point of water means the pressure of steam will be one atmosphere at 100 degrees. There is pressure of steam below 100 degrees also water is decomposing even below 100 degrees, but by decomposition temperature we mean 100 degrees when at it is one atmosphere. Under one atmospheric pressure of water, which means now its pressure has exceeded the pressure all around. If you take water to a higher temp, higher altitude on top of Mount Everest, there the atmospheric pressure is low, so the water will boil at a lower temperature, because you do not need one atmospheric pressure to have boiling, you can you do need less than that. That is what at higher temperatures cooking becomes very difficult, because water liquid water will not acquire the high temperature that you get in the plains, where the pressure or atmospheric pressure is higher. Similarly, when the pressure MgCO, this is decomposing into MgO plus CO2, when CO2 pressure becomes one atmosphere, we call it is the uh, decomposition temperature. The same thing goes with dolomite also. In the case of dolomite also, if you plot the weight change, we will find weight change initially will be small, again at some temperature it will rise which will decompose earlier? Will this decompose earlier or will this decompose earlier? Now, you can apply your common sense. In the case of MgCO3, MgCO3, you have pure MgCO3, whereas in dolomite, you have MgCO3 in solution. So, it is in more stabilized form. Therefore, one has to go to a slightly higher temperature to decompose dolomite for dolomite. This is for magnesite. Is that clear? Magnesite will decompose more easily because pure, but in dolomite, magnesite is in a kind of solution, there is calcium carbonate also, so it will decompose later. Now, generally 
the decomposition temperature of MgCO3 is around 660 degrees centigrade. There is another way in the laboratory we find out decomposition temperature and that is by differential thermal analysis. In this, two small crucibles are kept close together in a furnace, each with a thermocouple. In one, we keep the sample that is dolomite or magnesite. In another, we keep a reference material like alumina, where nothing happens when you heat. It does not decompose, it does not lose weight, it does not gain weight. What we and there are no enthalpy changes also. And there is an arrangement to measure the temperature difference between these two delta T is equal to T s minus T r. Again, what we will do is with time, we will slowly increase the temperature of the furnace. We constantly measure delta T. We will find initially delta T is 0. T is going up like this, increasing. This is delta T. It will be initially 0, because nothing is happening here, nothing is happening in the sample. They are both being heated at the same rate. They are both increasing in temperature, but they are equal means there is no difference in temperature between the two. But a time comes where a decomposition reaction starts here in the sample and when a decomposition reaction starts, it rise in temperature gets arrested. So, the reference goes up. So, the delta T between these two reference temperature continues to grow up, but the sample's temperature cannot grow up because a decomposition reaction is taking place and it is an endothermic reaction. So, they will build up a delta T. After it is all over, it will again catch up and they will both go up. So, the plot will be something like this. It is an endothermic reaction. Again, try to understand. Side by side, we are hitting two crucibles. One has the carbonate sample, the other has the reference. There is no change difference in temperature between the two, they are both rising. Then suddenly decomposition starts here, temperature cannot go up anymore, it is an endothermic reaction. This continues to go up with the furnace temperature, this one lags behind until everything is over and then it will go and catch up again. So, the delta T will plot an endothermic peak this is known as decomposition temperature. Which will be around 660 degrees. Now, so these are two common methods of finding out what will be the decomposition temperature of uh, magnesium carbonate. Now, once we have got we once once we have roasted or rather decomposed the dolomite, we have MgSCO and then we can reduce it by ferrosilicon. Basically, the reducing agent is silicon. Iron is not the reducing agent, it is silicon. Why I am writing ferrosilicon? Because in the market, it is much easier to procure ferrosilicon because ferrosilicon is produced as a ferro alloy. Producing pure silicon is lot more problematic, nor is it required. That is why 
although silicon is the reducing agent, we are adding ferrosilicon as reducing agent. But that also has an advantage. This ferrosilicon, this iron part will play a role and I will come to that. Anyway, this reaction is like this. Magnesium will produce vapor, calcium will combine with silica because silicon is a reducing agent. Iron is there, it really did not have a role as a reducing agent, it will be left free as a solid because the reaction is occurring around 1000 degrees. Now, if you make an analysis, thermodynamic analysis of both the reaction, one is that reduce MgO by silicon. I am ignoring iron for the moment because iron really has no role excepting that in ferrosilicon, iron is the vehicle for silicon. So, you consider decomposed magnesite which is 2 MgO, which is being reduced by silicon to produce Mg vapor and silica, for which the free energy change in the reaction is plus 52 kilo calorie, which means if you have pure MgO, pure silicon, if Mg is coming out as one atmospheric pressure and the silicon is there as silica unit activity, then the reaction is thermodynamically not feasible. Now, if silicon is to be taken as a ferrosilicon, where the activity of silicon is less than 1, it is convenient to have it that way, but then the reaction becomes more unfeasible because then the activity of silicon less than 1 means the reaction will be driven to the left, channel is driven to the left. Coming to decomposed dolomite, which is I am separating out 2 MgO and 2 CO as though they are two separate. This is also positive, 16, less than that, but it is also positive. Now, consider the second reaction. You can write delta G naught is equal to minus R T ln K and the K will be equilibrium constant activity of CO SiO 2, P M G O to the power square activity of silicon activity of CO activity of M G O. Let me write that. Delta G naught will be minus R T ln K equilibrium constant K is activity of CaO SiO 2 square into P M G O square divided by activity of CaO square activity of M G O square. Now, they are in pure states plus there is also activity of silicon. Now, they are in pure state, so forget about all this. Basically, it comes to minus R T P M G square. You can put values of R in kilo calories, T is T to the power, uh, if we calculate for 1200 degrees. Pressure of magnesium would be 15 millimeter. Mg. So, if it is less than 50 millimeter Mg, this reaction will be possible. That means, if we apply vacuum, so that the pressure of Mg is less than 15 millimeter, then this reaction, which we are trying to analyze, the 2 MgO, 2 SiO2, SiO2, it will become feasible. What is the arrow box? Is that clear? We have just considered one reaction and calculated the partial pressure of magnesium, and we have come to the conclusion 
that it has to be less than 15 millimeter mg. This is exactly what was done, what was accomplished by a gentleman called Pigeon with some of his associates during the Second World War. Incidentally, L. M. Pigeon after the war became the head of the Department of Metallurgy at University of Toronto. And when I joined University of Toronto as a graduate student, he was the head, he's a very kindly old gentleman, totally British, but he was very famous by this time and he was also decorated by the British because he made it possible for England to produce during the war magnesium metals, which were required urgently, not only for alloy making, but for any explosives and other things. His method was basically this. He actually took this decomposed dolomite, reduced it by ferrosilicon. Here the word C means solid. Many books write C as crystal. I have taken it from my own book. I have been using writing the word C, but it is S. Magnesium vapor, 2 CO, SiO2, solid, iron, solid. So, again I will read what is written here. On thermodynamic grounds, pure silicon cannot reduce MgO when both the reactants and products are in the standard state. To overcome this difficulty, Pigeon applied a reduced pressure to remove the magnesium vapor to drive the react reduction reaction to the right. In the pigeon's process, calcined dolomite is briquetted with powdered ferrosilicon, 75 percent silicon, 25 percent iron, and the reduction is carried out under vacuum of 0 0.1 millimeter mercury. So, 15 millimeter would make it feasible, 0 0.1 millimeter mercury at 1100 to 1200 C D in an externally heated retort as is shown here. Now, this is a retort which is in a furnace. The retort is protruding out because magnesium vapors will come and there are baffles here. Magnesium vapors will come and by the time they are coming here, temperature has come down, it is almost outside the furnace, they will solidify there. They would not escape through vacuum and they can be taken into the, it can be removed and later on the magnesium metal can be removed. It is about 3, milli, 3 meter approximately is the length. Now, two things happen here. First of all, you get you are solidifying magnesium vapors, and once they get solidified, there is no chance of any back reaction between magnesium and any residual oxygen, whatever that can be, it is not possible. Now, in theory, this is very simple, but this reaction also raises some questions. I have always been emphasizing this is not a course in chemistry that we write a reaction. We always think of the mechanism. How does the reaction take place? Because once you understand the mechanism, you can manipulate the reaction. Firstly, you understand the way it is written is solid calcined dolomite reacting with solid ferrosilicon. Now, any solid solid reaction is not a very efficient reaction because solid solid reaction means the that they must be in touch. Now, if you put a whole lot of solids together, you will find they touch only at certain points. They do not get compacted to each other, so their interficial contact areas are very small. Now, I will ask the question. Suppose you had put one solid here, another solid here, will the reaction take place? It will not take place because they are not in contact. If they just happen to touch each other, reaction will take place, but it will be a very slow reaction. Kinetics should be small because there is not enough surface area for reaction. So, many people have suspected that although you are writing the reaction like that, this is not the mechanism of the reaction because it implies solid solid reaction which it is really not. And then further 
studies have proved that this suspicion is correct. What happens is that when you have dolomite and you have calcined to produce a powder which is actually calcium oxide, magnesium oxide and you are putting ferrosilicon, you can powder that also 75 percent silicon. Initially, ferrosilicon reduces a small amount of calcium oxide to produce a liquid calcium silicon iron alloy. Once you have done that, the nature of the reaction changes entirely. It is no longer a solid solid reaction. Now, let us take it as a conjecture. Is it possible? Why should it not be possible? Silica can always reduce a small amount of calcium oxide and produce calcium metal and calcium metal silicon ion produces a low melting ternary, which is a melting point lower than that of ferrosilicon. Once you have that, then in the briquettes that you have made by putting together calcine dolomite and ferrosilicon, of course, you make a briquette. So, they bring the particles together, they increase contact area of particles. Now, in the contact area is no longer air, you have actually allowed a liquid metal to permeate all through. So, you have now created a medium for easy reaction. So, the reaction is no longer a solid solid reaction, which it would have been had there been no alloy of any kind. The reaction would now proceed rapidly at 1000 degrees, because that liquid layer takes in reactants, brings in products, takes in reactant, it permeates the entire body and the nature of the reaction changes. And this reaction is also slightly exothermic, so it is an advantage. This ternary alloy is now the main reducing agent, it is not ferrosilicon which is reducing, it is calcium, iron, silicon, ternary alloy which is the reducing agent. So, it is really not a solid solid reaction. Now, the idea of saying all this is it has nothing to do with thermodynamics, it has a bearing on kinetics. Like you know you can say if you suppose you have sugar to dissolve in water, thermodynamically dissolve, but if you make a big crystal of sugar put it in water, it has only that much of surface area which dissolves, it will take long time to dissolve, but if you take the sugar, crush it, make fine powder, surface area is very large. So, at the same temperature, in the same kind of stirring, same environment, it will dissolve much faster, because you have much larger surface area. Similarly, in this case, it is no longer a solid solid reaction, it becomes a solid liquid reaction and a liquid permeates all surfaces of solids. So, it is not changing thermodynamics, it is changing kinetics. This is the basis of Pidgeon's process, which was developed during the second world war. Now, there have been other developments in Pidgeon's process. One development is magnetron pro process in France. In magnetron process, they, they have answered this suspicion about solid solid reaction etcetera by going to a much higher temperature 1500 degrees. You do the same thing, you take ferrosilicon, you take calcined dolomite, 
take 250 nanotesla degree and add alumina in this to form a slag. So, you deliberately form a slag. So, what you are doing is you are producing now calcium oxide, silica, alumina, a ternary slag and you are producing a now a metal which is a vapor. And if there is ferrocidic and iron that will go also go into the slag or it will remain as liquid iron. Basi basically the whole idea is to speed up the whole thing first of all going to 1500 degrees means your kinetics is rapid. Secondly, you just eliminate this question of solid solid reaction bring in a, a low melting a ternary that will permute etcetera nothing is done. Just go to 1500 degrees make everything liquid you have a liquid slag to make it facilitate making a liquid slag put alumina and you can make a slag which will be useful elsewhere for cement making or whatever. That iron may separate out depending on the atmosphere if there is a leading atmosphere you will have iron in a separate layer. So, from ferrocilicon you get that iron, but our main aim is that product which is coming out as a vapor. Incidentally, at that temperature, perhaps you will not need this kind of vacuum because at that temperature, lot more magnesium will come out. So, it will be easier to recover magnesium also. So, this is a magnetron process. So, let me summarize now. I have started module 5, which is about extraction of metals from oxides by saying oxides are very common because in earth's crust you have abundance of aluminum, silicon and oxygen. So, we have silicates, aluminates, aluminum silicates. In these oxides many other oxides are also present, but there are also other deposits which are oxides which do not have alumina or silica like magnesite or dolomite. Plenty of these deposits are available. From dolomite which is more abundant by calcination we produce Mg, MgCl. This is the main raw material for magnesium production. Calcine dolomite which will be calcined at about 6 to 700 degree without fusion. It will be reduced by ferrosilicon at around 1000 degree to produce magnesium vapor which will be condensed and collected. Without application of vacuum this reaction is not possible because our calculations show partial pressure is only 15 mm per mercury. Vacuum applied is much much better than that. So, lots of magnesium can be produced this way. That is how it was produced during second world war very successfully and the process continues. This was tried out in national metallurgical laboratory Jamshedpur and a pilot plant was also run for a long time. Unfortunately, for various reasons as I said it is very good in R and D pilot plant also worked all right but it was not a commercial success. Some 10 years ago the plant was closed down then it remained closed for many many years until some party bought the whole, whole plant. But they have also failed to operate that plant. So, we are not producing magnesium in our country. All the attempts are going on to modify the pigeons process there are many modifications possible I need not go into that. Thank you very much.